Good morning and welcome back. Um, I'm going to talk this morning about troubleshooting deep neural networks. So, you know, troubleshooting and debugging, in my opinion, are the hardest part of getting deep learning systems to work in the real world. But my observation is that the top practitioners um, spend most of their troubleshooting and debugging time walking through a mental decision tree um, that's actually pretty simple. And so the goal of this lecture is to um, try to, um, to explain that decision tree to you. Um, but first, to kind of situate where we are in the course, um, I talked yesterday morning about planning and project setup. Sergey spoke yesterday afternoon about data collection and labeling. And the next step in, in our um, kind of project life cycle is to, you know, once you've um, collected a data set, is actually to, you know, pick a model and train it and debug it. Um, but first, you know, why, this, this is an hour and a half lecture. And so, you know, why are we spending so much time on this in like kind of an advanced course on deep learning? Um, you know, so here's one explanation, right? It's like, you know, you have a machine learning system and, um, you know, one characterization of it is you just pour a pile of data in and stir it up and then, you know, right answers um, kind of uh, come out. And maybe they look right or maybe they don't. And if they don't look right, then you just stir the pile some more and try again, right? So this is kind of like a pretty common um, feeling, I think, um, when building deep learning systems. Question already? Yeah. Speakers are not working. Um, how about now? Okay. It's just turned off. Um, this, this is why troubleshooting is so difficult, right? Um, <laughs> another characterization of this I liked is from, um, from Andre again. So, you know, it's debugging. First it doesn't compile and then it doesn't link. Then it seg faults and then it gives all zeros. Then it gives the wrong answer and then only maybe after, that, after all of that, does it finally start to work, right? And so I think this captures a pretty common sentiment among practitioners, which is really, you know, um, 10 or 20% of your time is like, quote unquote, the fun stuff, you know, deriving new math, implementing things, um, trying things out and making them work. And then 80 or 90%, even for like among, you know, some of the best people in the world at this, is spent debugging and tuning. And so the first thing I want to talk about is, you know, why, why is this the case, right? Why is deep learning troubleshooting so hard? So suppose that you have some result, maybe from a paper, and this is from the, the ResNet paper, and suppose you can't reproduce it. So maybe your learning curve looks like this. It's you know, worse than the one in the paper. Um, and the question is, how do you figure out why your performance is worse? Well, there's a few things that could cause it. You know, maybe you have an implementation bug, right? Um, and one of the challenges there is that most bugs in deep learning systems are actually invisible. So, um, you know, this is a, a real example, well, a cartoon example of a, a real problem that I had um, where my, you know, as I was training, my error actually wasn't going down. And this is kind of a characterization of what the code looked like. So I had some features and I had some labels and I was calling this Python function glob on them and then I was training. Um, actually, how many people know, can see already what the problem is here? Yeah. It's not sorted. Yeah, it's not sorted, right? So. Um, so, so glob actually doesn't deterministically return the, the order of, um, of files in a directory. And so I was mixing up the, the data and the labels. And this is actually a bug that I spent, I think, like more than a full day on early on in my PhD. Um, and I, and you know, I, I've talked to at least five or six other people who have spent at least a day on this exact same bug. right? And, but it's not at all obvious from this, this learning curve that this is something that you should look for. Um, but implementation bugs are really not the only cause of poor performance. It could also be hyperparameter choices. Um, this is a, a cartoon chart from the CS231N class, um, which characterizes, you know, uh, you finally learn well when you find a good learning rate, but uh, too low learning rate, too high a learning rate, or way too high a learning rate can all completely derail um, your, your training. Um, there's also a real example here, um, again, from one of the original ResNet papers, um, which shows that they chose a, they kind of invented a new initialization scheme, and they showed that their network actually doesn't train at all unless you use that particular weight initialization, right? So um, these, these models can be extremely sensitive to choices of hyperparameters, and if your model isn't working, it might be the case that you just haven't found the right hyperparameters yet. Okay, but that's not it, right? Um, it also, also could be the case that you haven't chosen the right model for your particular data set. Um, I think I see this a lot in image data, right? So maybe the data from the paper that you're trying to copy is ImageNet, because 
Most papers uh, focus on ImageNet. But yours might be self-driving car images. And these images look very different than the ImageNet images. And there's really no guarantees that the model that worked well on, image, on ImageNet will work well on your image data, um, although it's often the case. And then finally, the, um, another like, very common source of poor performance is just your data set was corrected, uh, um, constructed incorrectly. And we saw this, this chart last time in Lucas's talk, but it's you know, essentially um, from Andre Karpathy, and he said that you know, during his PhD, he spent all of his time thinking about models and very little of his time thinking about data. And now that he's the head of AI at Tesla, working on self-driving, he spends all his time thinking about data and very little thinking about models. And there's, you know, there's a bunch of possible issues when you're constructing a data set. You know, for one, you could just not have enough data. Um, you could have enough data, but the classes could be imbalanced, or the, no the labels could be noisy, um, or there could be a distribution shift between your training and your testing data. Um, so many, many different pitfalls um, when constructing a data set. So the takeaways here are, you know, the, the reason that deep learning troubleshooting is so challenging is because it's really hard to tell if you have a bug. And then even once you know you have a bug, there are many possible sources um, that could cause the same degradation in performance. And even worse than that, very small changes to your code base can cause huge changes in the performance of your model, um, like kind of minor details that you know, might be in like some footnote in the paper that you're trying to reproduce could be the key to you know, making something go from not working at all to working extremely well. And the next thing I want to talk about is, you know, um, given that this is so hard, what can we do about it? And um, I'm going to talk you through kind of a strategy um, that I use when I'm uh, troubleshooting models. But the first thing I want to talk about is, um, I think there's like a key mindset that you need to have um, when, you're, when you're actually going through this process. Um, any ideas what this might be? Yeah. Be very suspicious. Be very suspicious. I like that. That's exactly right. Um, it's pessimism. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, I think you need to be pessimistic because since it's so hard to disambiguate errors, um, you, you really need to, need to be careful that you're um, very critically looking at all the choices that you make when you're designing your model and your code base. Um, and so the implication of that is that um, really the best strategy is to start as simple as possible and then very gradually ramp up complexity. And we'll talk more about how to do that. And so the strategy that we're going to talk through today um, looks something like this. You start very simple, um, make you know, the simplest possible choices. Then you implement and debug those choices and evaluate their performance. Once you've evaluated their performance, you reach a decision point. And from there, you can either decide to you know, improve your model or improve your data set. Or you can just tune hyperparameters. And then eventually, once you go through this, lo this loop enough times, um, hopefully you get to the point where you finally meet your requirements and you're done. So starting simple, um, this usually means choosing the simplest possible version of your model and data set um, that you can get your hands on. And so in our, in our labs, for example, we've, um, instead of starting with you know, a very complex real data set and an LSTM with CTC loss, like a complicated model, instead we started with um, a fully, like just very simple, fully connected network or Lynette on um, EMNIST. So simplest possible model, simplest possible data. Once you've chosen those, then you implement your model and debug it. So make sure that you can overfit a single batch and maybe reproduce a known result. And then you evaluate the model. And, you, and to evaluate the model, you apply the bias variance trade-off and you decide what to do next. Then you tune your hyperparameters and finally, you prioritize improvements to your model and data. So maybe you move towards something that's more state of the art. Before we get to the point where this all makes sense, um, you need to have a few things in place. You need to have an initial test set. And you need to have a single metric to improve on that test set. All right, so coming back to the, to the first lecture, you need to have chosen what number you want to drive down. Um, and then also, the other thing that's really critical to have is some sort of target performance. And this can be based on human level performance or maybe you know, some paper that you're trying to reproduce or some other baseline that you have for your problem. 
And we'll use a running example here. And this example is um, you know, kind of a, a simple caricature of a, of a self-driving car problem. You have some images of, um, of driving scenes. And the goal is to uh, decide whether there's a pedestrian in this image or not. And the goal is to get 99% classification accuracy on this problem. And I hope in the real world, self-driving car companies are aiming for higher than 99% accuracy. <laughs> but, um, but for the purposes of this class, let's, we'll stick with 99%. OK. Um, any questions up until this point? Yes? Yeah, so the question is, do I have any strategies if, I'm, if you're using someone else's code? Um, we'll talk a little bit about that. Okay. Yeah. Yes? So when you say apply biospherics to your open AI body, so, I mean, you compare it with the validation step and then total performance? So the question is, um, what do you mean when you say apply biospherics trade-off? Um, we'll talk in great detail about that. OK. So starting with um, starting, with starting simple. There's a few steps here. And the first of these steps is choose a simple architecture. Um, I think architecture selection is something that's very intimidating for a lot of people. Um, and the good news is, and I think there's very good reason for that, because there's new architectures coming out every single week. And you know, state-of-the-art architectures are often extremely complicated and hard to understand. Um, but the good news is, I think at least in the first couple of stages of a project, um, you can follow a very simple um, procedure to choose a reasonably good architecture for your problem. So if, you're, if your data looks like images, then my recommendation is start with a Lynette-like architecture. And as you mature, um, you might want to move to using ResNets. Right? So these are, these are like two examples of um, types of models that have been around for a really long time um, uh, and are of different you know, sizes and complexities, but are proven to work on a lot of image problems. If your data is sequences, then the recommendation is just start with an LSTM with one hidden layer. And um, actually, there's one caveat to this, which is um, a lot of the li recent literature suggests that temporal convolu convolutions um, work sometimes like quite a bit better than LSTMs, and they're often easier to train. So you might want to consider using um, 1D convolutions instead of LSTMs. And then as you get more mature, then the next thing to try is an attention, mo uh, attention model or a WaveNet-like model. Um, these kind of are relatively easy to train and get close to state-of-the-art results on most sequence problems. If your data is something else, then you know, I think usually the starting point is just a simple, fully connected neural net with one hidden layer. And, you know, and then eventually you're going to move on to something more complex that depends a little bit on the specifics of your problem. OK, but this, you know, in a lot of real-world problems, you don't actually just have a single type of data. right? You don't just have images or just have sequences. So how do you deal with multiple input mo modalities? Um, so here's an example where we have two different input modalities. We have images um, of a cat, and then we have a sentence that says, this is a cat. And the goal is to figure out whether the sentence is true. And so the first step, if you have multiple types of inputs, is to map each into a comparable lower dimensional feature space. And so the way that we would do this in this example is we would map the images to a lower dimensional feature space using a ConfNet. And we would map the sentence to a lower dimensional feature space using an LSTM. And we would take the last output of the LSTM. Um, and then um, this is kind of like, in this shared feature space, it'll be easy to, easy to compare each of these representations. Um, so once we have. Uh, map all of the, the inputs into a lower dimensional feature space, and then we just concatenate them. Um, and then finally, pass through some fully connected layers into the output. Okay, so this is, um, I think, a reasonably good choice for most, most problems where you have multiple input modalities. Um, might not get you to the state of the art, but um, should at least be a very strong baseline. OK, so we've chosen our, you know, our simple starting architecture. Um, and we said that it's very important to use the right hyperparameters, because otherwise things might not work at all. So the next thing you need to do is just 
you know, choose sensible defaults to start with that you can iterate from there. Here are my recommendations. Um, for your optimizer, I think it's, it's always a good choice to start with the Atom optimizer um, with the magic learning rate. Um, and the magic learning rate is um, 3e negative 4. Don't ask me why it's magic, but it just, it just is, yeah. Um, for activations, I think if your model is fully connected or conv, then you should start with ReLU. And if you're using LSTMs, then you should start with 10H. Um, these are the initial initialization schemes that um, typically work, be uh, work best for these different activations. And I recommend starting with no regularization. And the reason for this is because um, regularization can add a lot of bugs. And the first goal when you're training your model should really be to drive training error down. And then only once you've convinced yourself that you can drive training error down should you start to worry about things like regularization. Um, similarly, I, I recommend starting without any um, normalization of your data, uh, batch norm, et cetera. Batch norm is actually like one of the, um, the worst culprits in terms of introducing bugs. Um, and I actually try to avoid it when I can. Yes? Can you, can you elaborate a little bit? Why does batch norm cause of bugs? Um, I think it's because the, like most of the off-the-shelf implementations are not easy to use. Like there's a lot of things you have to remember. For example, um, you often have to tell batch norm whether it's in train mode or evaluation mode. Um, and I think batch norm doesn't handle distribution shift very well. And a lot of the problems I work on deal with a lot of distribution shift. Yes? So, um, so it's, an, it's important to scale your inputs correctly, um, and I'll talk about that in a second. But, um, but yeah, so by normalization, I mean batch norm, layer norm, weight norm, things like that. And I also wouldn't do data augmentation. Yeah. Okay, and these are the definitions of the, the recommended initializers if you want to look at them later. So, once you've picked kind of sensible defaults for your simple architecture, the next step is to make sure that your inputs are normalized correctly. Um, and this is super critical. Like this, this is one of those things that can be the difference between your model working or not working. Um, and the initialization scheme to start with is very simple. Um, just subtract the mean and divide by the variance. And for images, um, it's fine not to do that. Um, often you can just scale the images to between 0 and 1 or between negative 0 0.5 and 0 0.5. Um, and you know, one pitfall here is that often your library will do this for you, and so just make sure that you're not dividing by 255 twice, because that's, um, that's another common bug that I've seen. Okay, so we have a simple architecture with sensible defaults and normalized inputs, um, and then the last thing that you might wanna try to do is simplify the problem as, as much as possible. Um, and this doesn't always make sense, but it's often a, a very good thing to do to start. So, an example of this is if I'm starting on, on a new problem, let's say I have a data set that's a million images. Um, as a starting point, one thing I might do is start with a much smaller version of that data set. So maybe a training set with 10,000 examples. And um, I might you know, reduce the number of classes, use maybe a fixed number of objects instead of using all the objects in my data set. Um, I might reduce the size of the images. Um, and this is all in, in service of you know, making sure that you have a problem that you're more confident that you can solve to start, and then adding back complexity later. You can also create a, sim uh, a simpler synthetic training set, which is what we're doing in the labs. Synthetic data is often um, easier to work with than real data, and it's often also easier for models to deal with. Yes? Yeah, so the question is, let's say you have a big data set and there's 100 classes, what's the best way to subsample that? Um, I think, so in general, it's really good to have balanced classes. Um, this just makes, makes training work better. Um, I think in this stage of, of problem setup, my recommendation would be to not use all 100 classes. I might start with just five classes or something and you know, five or 10,000 images and just make sure that I can get something working there um, and then, and only then, move back to the full data set with all 100 classes. 
Yes. Um, so when you do that, you tend to run into the example that your OK class or MD class or whatever you're looking at will be unbalanced if you switch from having multiple classes to just to fall. Right? I'm not sure I understand the question. So Um, so usually in classification, you have, you know, if you have five classes, then you have five possible outputs, right. um, one for each class. If you lump a bunch of them together, they're going to immediately going to be five balance, out of balance by a factor of five. Right. Um, I, I, I think I'm not understanding the question. Maybe, maybe let's take this offline. Okay, so coming back to our, our running example, pedestrian detection, right? So um, one way you might start this out is you might say, you know, we have, we're, we're a self-driving car company, so we have hundreds of millions of examples. Um, but maybe we'll start with a subset of 10,000 images, um, and maybe 1,000 for validation and 500 for test. And you know, since this is an, an image classification problem, we'll use a uh, Lynette-like architecture, and we'll use you know, just very simple sigmoid cross-entropy loss. And then, um, of course, we'll start with Atom Optimizer with the magic learning rate, and no regularization. All right. And so this is not going to solve our problem, but it's going to allow us to start to build the components of the system that we're confident will work so that when we scale up the complexity, um, we know that we don't have bugs um, introduced earlier in the pipeline. Okay, so to summarize, you know, starting simple um, involves choosing a simple architecture, which is usually Lynette or an LSTM or a fully connected network. And then you choose sensible defaults, which basically means atom optimizer and no regularization. You normalize your inputs so that they're in the right scale for your network to handle. And then you consider simplifying the problem. So just starting with the simpler version of your data set just to make sure everything is working. And the next step is to actually sit down and implement your model and then you know, debug that implementation. Um, and there, are, there are a few steps here. So the first thing that you're gonna do is you're gonna make sure that your model runs it all. And then once your model is running, then um, I highly recommend making sure that you can overfit a single batch. Um, and this is super critical because um, it actually catches a ton of bugs. Um, like you, you'd, be, you'd be shocked how many times I've like, implemented a model and um, it's not working and then I you know, finally go back and overfit a single batch and realize that I can't do it. And that will very much narrow down the space of, um, of possible bugs that you can consider. And then finally, once, you're, once you can overfit a single batch, then the next thing to do is try to find some known result that you can compare to. Um, and this is like kind of the last step in making you confident that your model is working the way that it should be working. All right, and just to give you a preview of you know, some of the, the most common deep learning bugs um, that, that I've seen, one of the most common, and these are really no particular order, but one of the most common is um, your, your tensors are the wrong shape, right? And so this is super dangerous because it can fail silently. Um, and the reason for that is in a lot, of, um, a lot of these deep learning languages like TensorFlow, you can accidentally broadcast um, tensors um, in, a way, in a way that you wouldn't even realize. Um, another very common bug is that you're pre-processing your inputs incorrectly. So you know, maybe you forgot to normalize things or you, know, you applied way too much data augmentation and the problem actually becomes kind of impossible for the network to solve. Um, but it's, it's difficult to catch this because oftentimes in machine learning, we're just looking at learning curves and we forget to go back and um, look at the training data that the model has access to and make sure that it's working correctly. Another thing I see a lot is actually passing the wrong input to your loss function. Um, so, you know, it, a, a lot of loss functions, default implementations of loss functions, expect logits, for example. So that's the output of your model before you pass it to a softmax. Um, but it's kind of very common to just softmax your output. And if you do that, then you know, the, the, the inputs to the loss function are gonna be scaled incorrectly and you won't be able to learn. Another thing I see a lot is, um, is and this is very common with batch norm, um, is forgetting to set train mode for the net correctly. Um, so you know, forgetting to tell batch norm that it's in train mode and so batch norm doesn't work at all. And then um, the last one that is like particularly painful and also comes up all the time is numerical instability. So getting you know, NANs in your, in your output. All right, so my general advice 
for making sure that your implementation is bug free is to start with a super lightweight implementation. And really the heuristic here is the, the minimum possible new lines of code um, for the first version. And so often a rule of thumb that I like to use when I'm implementing new research ideas is um, the first implementation should be like less than 200 lines of code. Um, you know, not counting things like, uh, like you know, tested um, components of your system that you already are pretty confident are working. But I'll usually start with a single file with like 100 or 200 lines of code and then, um, and then build up the complexity from there. Um, another thing that I think is, is super useful is start by using off-the-shelf components. Um, and this is, like, this is one, recommendation, uh, one reason we recommend Keras because um, the implementations in Keras are just very sensible and you kind of can be pretty confident that they're gonna work well. Um, or if you're using raw TensorFlow, you might wanna use TensorFlow's implementation of a dense layer as opposed to implementing it yourself. Um, and there are good reasons why you might want to change the default behavior of TensorFlow's um, dense layer implementation, but I wouldn't start there um, because you know, that's just another source of possible bugs that you can introduce. And similarly, um, with definitions of, of loss functions. Um, the last thing I would recommend is, you know, I would start with a version of your data set that you can load into memory. Um, so you can just, so you can eliminate very quickly data pipeline bugs. Uh, because data pipeline bugs can be very hard to catch, and you wanna make sure that you have eliminated other sources of error before you start to, uh, to ramp up the complexity of your data pipeline. Okay, so um, moving on from sort of the, the general advice to the actual steps that, that um, I follow when I'm implementing a deep learning model. Um, the first thing is just making sure that your model runs at all. Um, and there are a few common sources of reasons why your model might actually fail to run. Um, the most common, I think, are shape mismatches, casting issues, and out of memory. Um, but um, there are some others. So for shape mismatches and casting issues, um, uh, the, the thing that I would recommend doing is actually just stepping through model creation and inference in a debugger. Um, this can be tricky to do in TensorFlow, but we'll talk about some, some ways to do it. Um, and for out of memory issues, um, I think the, the simplest resolution is just to scale back your memory intensive um, operations one by one until you've kind of eliminated the source of, um, of your out of memory. And then for you know, most other types of errors, there's kind of no real general advice other than um, you know, the standard debugging toolkit, which is just like basically Google everything. <laughs> um, so stepping through things in a debugger, um, one reason that PyTorch is really easy is because PyTorch just makes this process super easy. You can just use um, IPDB or some other interactive debugger and step through your model. In TensorFlow, it's a little harder. Um, and so I'll talk about a, a couple strategies that I use. So one is to step through graph creation. So what this looks like is um, you, you, know, you jump into a debugger and then you manually go through each line of creating your model um, step by step. And the, the types of things that I'll look for here are just making sure that the shapes look sensible um, and kind of making sure that the operations that I'm doing are what I would expect them to look like. Um, but this, this doesn't catch a lot of things because you're not actually running your tensors when you're doing this. And so the next thing you can do is um, step into the training loop. And so what this looks like is you, you know, um, in your training loop while you're looping over your number of epochs, you can import a debugger and then every time you call sesh.run, you can go back and look at um, what the outputs of that run call are. Um, and so you know, hopefully you can catch like kind of in your first training step um, if the numbers that are being output look reasonable or, if, or if, for example, they're you know, way too large or way too small. And then the last thing, um, and I haven't actually personally done this that much, but it seems like potentially a really useful tool is to use um, TFDB, um, which is a, a TensorFlow debugger. And the way it works is every time it hits a sesh.run call, it stops the execution and lets you inspect things. Um, and so it seems like it, it might be a good way of um, eliminating some of the manual work required when you're doing the, the option two.
Okay, um, any questions up until this point? Yeah. Um, can I talk, uh, I, I didn't hear the question entirely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so the question is out of memory bugs when you have a distributed setup. Um, yeah, these, these can be like extremely difficult to diagnose. Um, I think I would start by making sure that you don't have any out of memory bugs um, in your single GPU implementation. Um, and then if you're scaling up to to distributed, and that's the thing that introduces out of memory. Um, yeah, I don't have a specific recommendation there. It's it's like genuinely hard. Okay, let's um, let's zoom in quickly on shape mismatch issues. Um, so there are a lot of possible causes for you know why you might have a shape mismatch between two different tensors. Um, Two I'll highlight are the ones I think are the two most painful, which are the last two. Um, so the second to last one is, you know, you forgot to get rid of extra one dimension. So you reduce some tensor, maybe you took a max along some axis, and you end up with a dimension that's one. Um, this, this is like super common for a lot of operations and can be um, pretty annoying to catch. And then um, the last one, which is, you know, one thing that I've seen a few times is if you store data on disk, um, maybe it's, data from NumPy, and so it's stored in float 64, but you try to load it as float 32, then often what happens is um, everything is like twice as large as you expect it to be. Um, and so this can be like a particularly painful type of shape mismatch to debug. Um, casting issues, I think these are usually pretty straightforward. Um, the thing to remember is that in, you know, in TensorFlow, for example, usually you want things to be float 32s. And so if your data is coming from some other source, like if it's coming from images or if it's coming from, um, from NumPy, then just make sure that, it's, that things are being casted correctly. Okay, um, out of memory issues. These are, I think, some of the, the hardest bugs to fix. And my general strategy here is, you know, so there, there's a lot of possible causes of them. Um, And my general strategy here is usually um, two things. So the first is um, I'll usually just start by trying to make the batch size smaller. So if you make the batch size smaller, then, um, then each of your tensors that you're creating um, will take up less memory on your GPU. And so I'll run things again and hopefully can get things running that way. Um, and then once you have things running that way, then I'll, um, I'll simply log GPU memory utilization um, and I'll let the training run run. Um, and I'll just, I'll make a graph of that. And if the GPU memory utilization is going up, then I'll look for um, places where I might be kind of um, unexpectedly adding memory um, during the training process. Another strategy that you can use for, um, for memory leaks in TensorFlow is um, freezing the graph. Um, so there's a way in TensorFlow of um, finalizing the graph before you actually run things. And what this will do is actually throw an error um, every time a new tensor is created. So this is a useful way of just making sure you're not creating tensors when you're not expecting to. Question. Yeah. Yes. Hey. So, so you mentioned looking at the GPU memory. I mm -hmm. noticed the Keras usually will scrabble GPU memories when you compile your model. Mm -hmm. Is there a way to check like how much memory you're actually using with, with using Keras? Yeah. So um, the I think you you need to use um, uh, you you actually need to to query the system um, like. Uh, think about like using NVIDIA SMI or something like that. Um, mm. So th there's also a way to do this in TensorFlow, in raw TensorFlow, um, where you, um, yeah, um, I can't remember the details of, of how to set this up, but um, yeah, you, you, you should be able to print like kind of how much, um, like what, uh, how many, like the, the total th size of the tensors that have been allocated. Um, so yeah, by default, TensorFlow will grab all the GPU's memory. Um, but that doesn't tell you, that, so that tells you that it's, it's reserving the GPU and it's not letting anything else take that memory, but it doesn't tell you how, the total size of the tensors that have actually been created. Other questions on, um, on out of memory? This has like probably been the biggest source of pain for me in implementing um, deep learning models, yeah.
Yeah, so, so the question is, um, one thing that can cause a lot of um, out-of-memory issues is when you're passing the output of a conf to a fully connected. Um, and you know, how does global average pooling help with that? So I guess, so actually fully connected layers in general are a very big source of out-of-memory issues. And the reason is that um, there's just a lot of connections between, fully, uh, between subsequent fully connected layers, right? So if you, um, you, know, you take the, the input of one and the app, uh, the, out, the output size of one and the input size of the next one, and you multiply those together. That's kind of like how you can think about um, uh, how much memory is being taken up by that. Um, and so average pooling is a way of reducing the size of the output of the first one before you pass it to the second one. So like if you, so if you for example, do a two by two average pooling on the output of a convolutional network, then you reduce the number of um, weights in that tensor by a factor of four. Right. And so then, if you, um, then when you pass that to a fully connected layer, it's actually taking up four times less um, memory to store, to store, the, um, to store the, the, the matrix that's using to perform that, um, that matrix multiplication. Yes? Yeah, so the question is, do you ever look at the total number of parameters in the model. Um, I think that's, a, that's an interesting metric to look at. The, the way I use that normally is just to get a, a high level sense of, um, you know, um, is, this, like, is this model close to being a big enough model that you'd expect things to be state of the art? So you can look at the total number of parameters in state of the art results. Um, and you know, if you're many orders of magnitude away from that, then there's a very good chance that scaling up the size of your model will have a big impact. Um, but if you're already, you know, if you already have the same number of parameters as you know, whatever the best results in your, your domain are, then you, know, um, you can still try scaling up, but chances are that the reason why the um, state-of-the-art results use that many parameters might be that it's hard to use more. Yes? Can you elaborate a bit on the loading tool as a data set into memory rather than using an input Yes. Um, so the question is, can you elaborate on loading too large a data set into memory? Yeah, so, so um, very common issue is, like, usually when you're starting out training a model, um, you know, say you're using MNIST, then um, one way that you can train an MNIST is you can just, like, literally create a NumPy array with all of the MNIST data. Um, and the reason is that the data set is super small, so the entire data set can fit in memory. Um, but the issue that you run into is when you move to more complex data sets, maybe your images are uh, much larger. So maybe they're 200 by 200 instead of 32 by 32. And in addition to that, you have way too many, uh, you have like way more images. So you might have you know, millions of images instead of tens of thousands. And so the problem is when you try to follow the same approach, which is just stuffing everything into, into one big array and putting that in memory, then you'll very quickly exhaust the memory of your system. Um, and so the solution to that is to, um, is to set up a pipeline that essentially takes um, chunks of your data set and, um, and in the background feeds them into tensors that can be used um, by, by your training pipeline. Um, there are a few good ways to do this. Um, we, we have one in the lab that's based on the Keras pipeline for this. And then um, in TensorFlow, the, the tf.data API is, um, is also quite good at this. Yeah? Just curious, why can you worst experience? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what's, what's been my worst out of memory bug? Um, My worst out of memory bug, so um, I think this is not the, the worst one in the sense that it took me the, the most time to find, but I think it was the worst in terms of like the, um, how bad I felt after I finally found, found it. Um, and it was basically I had a method called like self.loss or something like that. And, um, and so every time I, I trained, every tra time I ran a training set, I was, um, you know, I, was, I was training an optimizer that called self.loss. But what self.loss was doing is it was actually doing a multiplication um, of two things. And so every time that I called self.loss, it actually allocated a new tensor. And so it was really frustrating because you know, everything would work fine for like three or four epochs. And then all of a sudden, I would just get out of memory. Um, um, yeah, but it turned out that it was just because I was creating new ops every time I, every time I ran it.
Okay, um, and the last thing to say here is that um, this is not a comprehensive list. So there's, there's many different things that could cause your model not to run, um, but I, I tried to capture the most common ones here. All right, so once things are running, you know, once you can actually run training and, um, and your loss starts to move, then the next thing to do is to try to overfit a, overfit a single batch of data. Um, and this is a, like, in my experience, this is a heuristic that catches an absurd number of bugs. Um, and what this actually means is, um, you know, it's not that you want loss to go down on a single batch, but you really want to be able to get loss arbitrarily close to zero on a single batch. And there are a few ways that can fail. Um, you know, so instead of going to zero, your error could go up, or your error could go down for a while and then explode, or your error could oscillate go down and go up, and then go down and go up, or your error could plateau. You know, it goes down to 0 0.01 and never gets any lower than that. Um, if error goes up, most commonly, this is probably due to a flip sign somewhere. Like maybe you're, um, maybe you're, you're minimizing the, um, the log probability instead of the negative log probability. If the error explodes, I think most often this is caused by a numerical issue. So um, you know, you're taking an exponent somewhere or you're, you're taking a log somewhere of a negative number, for example. If the error oscillates, um, the thing I would try usually first is um, just lower the learning rate. So your learning rate might be too high. And if that doesn't work, then I think the next step is really to take a look at your data um, and just make sure that your, you know, your labels are in the right order and your data is not being corrupted in some way. If the error plateaus, um, usually what I would try is just turning up the learning rate to start and um, making sure that you've gotten rid of all of your regularization. So like over-regularizing is a common uh, cause of not being able to overfit a single batch. And if none of those things work, then I would just you know, carefully look at your loss function. Make sure that the, you have the right inputs to it and it's being computed the right way. And um, I would go back and look at your data pipeline. So again, just you know, take a peek at your data and make sure it's, it appears that it could be um, it could be fit by this model. Okay, so last, you know, you, you've um, created your model, you make sure, you've made sure that it runs, and you've overfit a single batch. So I think the last step here is to compare to a known result. And not all known results are created equal. So here's kind of, um, different known results that you could compare to, I think, in order of usefulness. So the most useful known result is to find an official um, implementation of the model from you know, the authors of the paper or from like, one of the big labs. And I would evaluate it on your data set or a similar data set to yours. And the, the thing that this lets you do is you can actually walk through the code um, line by line, side by side, between your implementation and their implementation. And um, this, this can let you find the exact line where, um, where your result differs. If, um, if you can't do that, if you can't compare on a, uh, a similar data set, then you can at least compare on some simpler data set or some benchmark data set like MNIST. And so you can do a lot of the same things here, but um, you still might have um, errors that cause performance to be worse on your more challenging data set. If you can't find the official model implementation, then often people have implemented models um, on their own and posted them on GitHub. And so this is also a really good resource. One caveat here is um, I would say like half or two thirds of the, of the like random implementations of papers that I see on GitHub have pretty serious bugs in them. Um, so this is a, like a useful tool, but just be very, very careful when you're just using some, someone's random you know, GitHub implementation that you found. Um, if you can't find any code, then you can just compare it to the results of the paper. And what this lets you do is just make sure that your performance is at least on par with what the authors say that you can expect. Um, you know, important caveat here is that um, often the results reported in a paper are extremely hard to reproduce because they require a very, very specific um, implementation and hyperparameter setting, um, or because they're kind of cherry picked among many random seeds. Um, and so this is not always possible, but it's a, it's a uh, if you can do it, it's a good thing to do. 
Um, you can compare to, to uh, you, can, you can look at the results, like the absolute number of your results on a benchmark data set. So if you're working on some complicated image data set and things aren't working, then maybe take a step back and try it on, on um, MNIST. And you know, if, you're, if your accuracy on MNIST is only 90%, then you know that there must be some bug in your pipeline. Because basically, any re reasonable image model should be able to get 99% on MNIST. Um, and if you can't do that, then you know, maybe compare a similar model on, on a similar data set or on MNIST. Um, and then lastly, like, you know, just going back to the point that I made yesterday, but you, know, you should always make sure that you can do better than the simplest possible baseline. So you know, if you take the average of all the outputs, um, you, should be, you should be doing like, quite a bit better than that. Right? Um, and you should also hopefully be doing better than linear regression. And if you're not, then you know, there's a very good chance um, that there's a bug in your model. OK, so just to summarize, um, you know, how, like, how do I recommend that you actually implement your model and debug things? So the first step is get your model to run. Um, and this involves you know, stepping through in a debugger and just making sure that all the shapes make sense. And then make sure that you're casting everything into the, the data format expected by your, um, your framework. And then be very, very careful about out of memory issues. And, um, and once your model is running, then it's a very good idea to try to overfit a single batch of data. And once you can do that, then find some existing result that you can compare your, um, your model to and make sure that your results do as well as that. All right, I'll pause there. Um, any questions about kind of strategies for implementing models and you know, making sure that there are no bugs in your implementation? Yes? Mm -hmm. um, how large should that batch be so we can just like a sample of five? I mean, like, have you seen that it can increase like the like the yeah like for that batch like like be kind of the error show or not? Because if it's small, then you may not see it, but only when it's really big or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the question is, um, when you're overfitting a single batch, how big should that batch be? Um, it doesn't actually matter so much. Usually what I'll do is whatever batch size I'm planning to use for my experiments, um, that's the batch size I'll use. And then sometimes um, a thing that I've done a few times is if you can't actually overfit, like say your batch size is 128, and you try overfitting 128 data points and you can't do it, then another reasonable thing to try is um, overfitting a single data point. And if you can't overfit a single data point, then um, that, that probably means that um, that there's something like very, very wrong, right? Because you're literally just taking gradients on a same, the same data point over and over again. You should be able to get to zero error. Yes? If you're overfitting to a single box, do you apply any box mix to that box? Uh, box if overfitting to a single batch, do you sub batch that batch? No. You just literally pass the same data to the model over and over again. Yes? Yeah, rules of thumb for iteration speed. Um, my rule of thumb for iteration speed is you should try to make sure that you, um, like the thing that saves you the most time in the long run is um, not introducing bugs early on in your, in your pipeline because the longer you wait, like the more mature your code base gets, the bigger your model gets, the bigger your data set gets, the harder it is to fit to find really simple bugs. Um, so my rule of thumb is like, if you're planning to work on this for a long time, you're doing yourself a disservice by not being like 99.9% .9 confident that you've eliminated all bugs before moving on to the next step. Yes? So the optimization problem that uh, Adam solved is Usually unconstrained with respect to the weight or the neural network. 
you know any set of food constraints that we can consider for the way that uh, we, we constrain the problem with respect to the way, and then we, we can have like, a little bit more guarantee to, to find a good solution? Yeah, so the question is, um, are there, are there good constraints to put on the weights to, to make sure that you find a good solution? Um, constraints are, are um, like in some sense equivalent to regularization. And um, when you're in the very early stages of the project, like when you're still trying to make sure that you don't have any bugs, I don't recommend using any constraints or rec regularization. Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, um, these are all, this is all talking about parts of the code base that you can control, but you're you know, almost always going to be relying on code bases that someone else writes. And so how can you make sure that when they change things, they don't introduce bugs in your code base? Um, I think the best practice here, and this is sort of related to some of the discussion that we've been having in the labs, but I think the best, best practice here is to pin to a very specific version of each of the code bases you're using. And um, that doesn't mean that you should only ever use that version, but just be very conscious about when you're updating versions of software that you rely on. And, um, and when you're doing that, that should be like the only change that you're making. Um, and so you can isolate that change and um, hopefully have a bunch of tests in place or at least be able to run training and make sure that your performance gets to the same level before and after you update that dependency. Yes? I'm not sure I understood the question. So in your presentation, your session, will you touch a little bit on the way you would debug the distribution of gradients and the uh, Will I touch on the way you debug distribution of gradients? No. Yeah, in the back. Yeah, so tips for working with off-the-shelf code bases. Um, I think that this exact same um, set of, of steps applies. And like, in particular, one thing that I would recommend avoiding is just saying, like, okay, um, you know, Facebook released some code base um, you know, that, um, that does object detection, and it seems to work really well. And so I'm just going like, to drop that into my code base and try to make sure, and then like, try to get it to run. Like, I think that's a recipe for spending weeks and weeks and weeks debugging. Um, like the, the linkages between them and then all the bugs in the Facebook code base and you know, all the problems with your data set. Um, I would still recommend just like figuring out what's a really simple baseline that you can implement to make sure that your, um, to make sure that your training code and your data pipeline are bug free. And then once you're confident about that, um, hopefully you've written things in a modular enough way that you can um, just kind of hook the, the external code base in. I think, I think that's the best practice for doing this. Um, yeah, I'll take maybe one more question on this and then, um, and then move on. Yeah, in the back. Yeah, um, any advice on using cyclical learning rates? Um, it, can, it can work really well. It's like one tool in the toolbox. Um, yeah, I mean, I think in general with hyperparameter selection, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that, but um, it's hard to give general advice on that because you know deep learning is an empirical science, and ultimately, like different um, hyperparameters and different tricks work well in different data sets. And so, I think it's like good to be aware of things like cyclical learning rates. And in, for some problems and some models, they can make a big difference. For others, it won't. It won't be worth the effort. Okay. So you know now we're at the stage where you know we've started with a really simple model. And we've implemented it, and it's bug-free. And you know, so now the question is, like, what do we do next? You know, should we increase the complexity of our model? Should we go and gather more data? Um, should we do something else? And the strategy I recommend here is, um, is you know, evaluating the performance of your model and prioritizing improvements based on the bias, variance, decomposition. And I'll explain what that means. Um, 
So you know, here you have some baseline, like some, some level of human level performance, and you have some training error. And typically what you'll see is that if you plot the validation error, it's um, a little bit higher than the training error. And the test error is even a little bit higher than the validation error. And this points to kind of a way of decomposing your test error into component parts. And so the first component part is the component that comes from your, um, your, your baseline performance, your, like, let's say your human level performance. And this is the irreducible error. So this is the error that maybe you can't really expect your model to do better than this error. Um, then there's a gap between your best possible performance and um, your training error. And that gap is your avoidable bias. So this is, um, this is a measure of, of um, how much you're underfitting your data set. Then there's another gap between your training error and your validation error, and this is the variance. So this is a measure of how much you're overfitting to your training set. And then finally, um, there's a gap maybe between your validation error and your test error, and that gap tells you about how much you're overfitting to your validation set. And so you know, to summarize, um, the bias variance decomposition says that your test error is just a sum of some irreducible error plus your bias, plus your variance, um, plus maybe some validation set overfitting. Okay, and so one assumption implicit here is that um, training, validation, and test all come from the same distribution. And so what happens if that's not the case? So let's say that your training data is you know, self-driving cars during the daytime, and your test data is, is self-driving cars at night. One strategy that can work pretty well here is to actually use two validation sets. Um, one sampled from the training distribution and one sampled from the test distribution. And, um, and so, you know, why, like, why might you do this at all? Well, maybe your training data is much more plentiful. Like, maybe it's much easier to collect data during the daytime than it is at night for whatever reason. Um, and so you want to do most of your training on that data set. Um, but it's still important to have a validation set that comes from the data distribution that you ultimately want to evaluate your, evaluate your model on. Yes? Um, at this point, can you see um, that the data that I'm supposed to perform kind of well on are like very different? Do you just deploy like a strategy of having two separate models? To then, or, and then you have a part of the pipeline that has like a um, detection to like predict <coughs> either model? Or have you seen from your experience that these kind of like deep learning systems should be able to handle both? So the question is if you have two kind of data modalities, should you just employ two different models or should you have, try to have one model that does well on both? Um, depends a little bit on how similar the data um, is and how similar the task that you want to do on the data is. Um, in general, it's usually better to use a single model because um, it's much more efficient because the model will kind of learn general things about um, images or about car images that are true in both the daytime images and the nighttime images. And so it'll be more efficient to train jointly on both if you can. Um, but this is really about the specific case where you have you know, some distribution where it's easy to gather data, but you care about your performance on another distribution where it's hard to gather data. And so the recommendation is have one validation set for each. And if you plot our loss curves here, what this does is it adds um, another loss curve between your training error and your test set validation error. Um, and this is your training set validation error. And if we go back to the breakdown of the bias, um, of bias and variance, we've added, a, um, we've added another component here, which is um, in addition to the bias, the variance, and the validation set overfitting, there's also the difference between your training validation error and your testing validation error. And um, we'll call that the, the distribution shift. Yes? Um, so, not sure I understand the question, yeah. So, when you're doing the training, you don't want to train on the validation, so I, I guess I'm kind of confused on, like, uh, the training validation error, mm -hmm. um, like, what, what data set is it? So let's yeah. say you have a set of, like, 10,000 images, um, or daytime, or you just set aside 3,000 of them for um, the training validation error? Um, yeah, yeah. 
So, so concretely, I think like an example of how you could do this is, let's say that you have um, 10,000 images of daytime cars and 1,000 of nighttime cars. So what I might do is I might take 9,000 daytime cars and make those my training set, and then um, 1,000 daytime cars and make those my train validation set. And then I might take 500 um, nighttime cars and make those the test validation set, and then hold out the other 500 as the test set. Yeah, so the question is like, what could make these things be different? Um, usually, the, the reason that you'll see that is because, um, is because there's some difference in the difficulty of the different data sets, right? So like, um, often you'll see this if, you know, for whatever reason you have more variance in your training set than you do in your validation set. And so if those, if those things are not in the right order, then I would just go back and look at those data sets and make sure that um, they're actually representative. Yeah, um, so one thing that's very common is for the test and validation curves to be identical, and that's a really good sign. Um, that just means that your um, validation set is representative of your test set. But in general, there will be a gap, and the reason that there will be a gap is because if you're running a lot of experiments on the same validation set, then um, eventually you'll kind of pick hyperparameters that cause you to, to do well on that validation set, and so you'll overfit to that validation set um, through kind of hyperparameter selection. Um, so an example of, of like how you might use this to make a decision about what to do next. So we're doing our pedestrian de example detection, and our goal performance was 1%. Um, but let's say our training error is 20%, and our validation error and test error are even worse. Um, so there's a gap of 19% between training error and um, goal performance. Um, but there is also a gap between train and val. So there's some, um, some overfitting. And there's a very, very small gap between validation and test. So we're not really overfitting to our validation set. Um, and, so, you know, and, so, and so the next thing that we'll talk about is um, what decision should we make um, from, from this data? How do you go about figuring out how large your test and validation sets need to be to give you meaningful information, especially when you're dealing with smaller data sets and you have to make that trade-off between giving your model more data for performance and then getting a representative yeah, um, so the question is, how do you decide how big validation and test should be? Um, and I think like in traditional machine learning, the rule of thumb was like 30% of your data should be validation and test. Um, in deep learning, I usually see more like 10%. Um, so that's, I think, a reasonable rule of thumb. If you have 100,000 images, then you might take 90,000 of them and train on them and then reserve the other 10,000 for validation and test. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when it comes, so the question is, um, talk about transfer learning. Um, I'll talk about that a, a little bit in a second. Okay, so you know, the, the quick summary here is, um, your goal is to improve your test error, um, but in order to decide what to do next, you need to decompose that test error into you know, irreducible error, which you don't think you can do better than, um, bias, which is the difference between your training error and your irreducible error, variance, which is the difference between validation error and training error. Um, distribution shift, which is the difference between the error in your two validation sets, if you have them. Um, and then validation overfitting, which is the difference between your value, uh, validation error and your test error. Okay, and so the, the next thing to do is um, to, to figure out what to do um, about your model, given that data. And so, I think the like the order in order to the order to fix problems for your model is start by addressing underfitting. Um, once you've eliminated underfitting, then and only then address overfitting. Um, and then once you're comfortable with um, how well your model performs on your train val set, then move on to distribution shift. Um, and then finally look at the difference between val and test and rebalance your data sets if you need to. Okay, so the first of these is addressing underfitting. Um, and 
there, there are a bunch of different strategies for this. Um, I've tried to order them here in terms of like how, how well I think they work. Um, I think like the first thing to try is usually just make your model bigger. So if, you're, if you can't get your training error low enough, then just add more layers. Um, and in, in deep learning, this, this, uh, this very simple strategy works um, shockingly well. Um, another thing you can do is just reduce regularization. You might be over-regularizing. Um, you can do error analysis, and I'll, I'll talk more about this in a second. But this just involves looking at the places where your model makes errors and then trying to understand them. You can choose a different architecture. So you can move from Linet to ResNet, for example. Um, you can tune your hyperparameters, um, or you can add features to your data set, which is not something I usually recommend in, um, in a deep learning context. OK, so coming back to our example, um, you know, uh, we, we had this training error that was really bad. So there's a 19% gap between training error and our goal performance. And so our conclusion was we had massive overfitting. Um, and so the first thing that we might try to address this is we might add more layers to the ComNet. And maybe that gets us from 20% train error to 7% train error. But that's still not good enough. So maybe we'll switch now from using a simple ComNet to using a ResNet. And that could take us, let's say, from 7% error to 3% error. Still not quite where we need to be. So now maybe we'll tune the learning rate. And we'll do some hyperparameter search and find the best learning rate for this problem. And you know, maybe this is the thing that will finally drive us below, uh, below our goal performance. So we've, we've um, eliminated our underfitting. And another thing to note here is um, kind of how this validation curve looks, or how this validation error looks as we're tuning our training error. And this is kind of pretty common. Usually, as you start to drive your training error down, um, your validation error goes down with it. But then eventually, you find some, um, you, you, uh, your validation error stops going down. And a lot, of, a lot of your improvement in performance comes from overfitting your, your data set a little bit. Yes? When do we add branches to the ComNet or these architectures? And why you should, when you should add branches and when you should not? And how many branches like, you should usually add? When should we add branches to the ComNet? Um, uh, problem dependent. Yeah, I mean, I, I think like the way I would look at this is um, branches are just an architecture choice. And um, in general, like I think um, the first thing I would recommend is making your model bigger. And if you make your model bigger and you stop getting improvements in performance, then I would like do a little bit of a literature search and look for um, what architectures achieve closer to state of the art performance uh, and move towards those. And maybe those have branches in them. Why branches make sense? Um, I think like outside of the scope of this discussion. So I'll talk to you about it offline. How do you know that you actually address the underfitting? Because you never know the reducible error on the side. Yeah, um, th this is a great point. So the question is, how do you know that um, that your irreducible error is actually irreducible error? Like how can you, you can't really know that, right? And so that's, that's absolutely correct, right? So um, all that we can do is like kind of make a best approximation of what we think um, the irreducible error is. And um, so this is kind of like why it's important to find really good baselines, like to find the best possible baseline that we think we can get. Because then we have more confidence that one, once we get lower than that, then we're sort of in, in the realm of where we think we're like nearly as good as our model, as our model can do. Um, and the other point to make here is that this can evolve throughout the course of the project. So maybe when you start working on your project, you, know, you, um, you think that you, uh, your target is really 10% error. Um, and then maybe like over the course of the first couple of months of the project, you eventually hit that 10% error. And um, you realize that actually you can do better than that. And so you might adjust that goal. Yeah? Uh, when you say 10% error, is that referring to the, the difference between the validation training and validation test? Or is this the actual reserve test set? Um, test error is the reserve test set, yeah. And, and are we supposed to uh, keep that hidden to ensure that we're not overfitting the test set in the same way we had the validation overfitting when we now look to have test overfitting? Yeah, so th this is a really important point. Um, I'm showing what your test error might look like here. But um, in practice, you should, um, you should measure your test error infrequently. And so for example, like if your training error is really high, um, I just wouldn't even look at your test error. Like the point where I, where I would, 
And so this kind of also has to do with the order in which you fix these things, right? So first you fix um, training error, and then you fix validation error, and then you fix test error. And so you know, if, um, uh, if I was actually working on this problem, I would fix training error, and then I would drive validation error down, and then I would look at test error and just see if I've, like, through the course of driving validation error down, whether I've, um, whether I've introduced some overfitting to that validation set. Okay, so um, we're no longer overfitting, and so now we need to address underfitting. Um, I think, like, the, again, the simplest and best strategy here is just add more training data. Um, if you can do this, this is generally by far the best thing you can do. Um, not always possible, so you can also add normalization. You can add, you know, batch norm or layer norm. Um, these actually serve as, uh, as regularizers, so they can re reduce your overfitting. Um, data augmentation is also a very good way of getting the most out of a smaller um, training set. Regularization, so explicit regularization, like dropout um, and, uh, and um, L2 penalties um, can also be useful, but I think I would, I would try normalization and data augmentation first. Um, again, error analysis, and we'll come back to this. And, um, and then there's some other things that I, I recommend less. So I actually think that removing features, reducing model size, and early stopping, um, these, are, these are strategies that can reduce overfitting, but they're not things that I recommend in a deep learning context. Yes? Yeah, so are there techniques for doing data augmentation outside of images? Um, in many domains, yes. Um, but um, yeah, it it's, it's, depends on the specifics of your data. Uh, yeah? Uh, when you say normalization, let's see, most people would normalize an image in perspective that way, you almost do it on text. Can you rationally behind that or should you? Hmm. Yeah, so the question is do you normalize text? Um, yeah, I mean, like it's a, like sometimes something that I see is like people will do a um, like a word embedding before they before they pass it into their their text model. Um, you can think of that as a form of normalization, um, but yeah, you're right. It's it's less common to do that for text. Yeah. Why why do you don't recommend early stopping? Um, I don't recommend early stopping because um, I uh, find it kind of hacky and. I think that usually, um, like, uh, and and also like, I just I think it's like really hard to actually execute properly. Um, so I think like in my experience, um, if you find yourself needing to resort to early stopping, then that means you're like kind of very quickly starting to overfit. And so I would actually try to address the root cause um, by adding some sort of normalization or adding more data um, before. Um, you know, r rather than just doing early stopping. Although, like, I'll admit that in practice, this is this like can be a useful thing to do. Yep. Um, which type of regularization is best? Um, dropout seems to be best. Beyond that, it's uh, problem dependent. Yes. Yeah, so if you don't do early stopping, then you just train for some you know, fixed number of epochs. Yeah, I guess actually this is like, comes down a little bit to why I don't recommend early stopping, which is like usually in, um, in deep learning, like the paradigm that you're trying to follow is like bigger models, more data. Um, and so you know, usually, like, um, and, and so if, if you can do this, right? And so if you can do this, then um, typically you, like, the number of epochs that you train for is determined by your computational budget. Um, so you know, if you have a, a big model training on millions of images on HGPUs, like maybe you can, you really think that like the cost benefit says that you can train for a week, and any more than that is like not worth it. Um, and so you know, and so that's and, and so that's kind of like the the, term, the determining factor for how long you would train for. Um, in when you're in a domain where you have like significantly less data, um, that makes less sense. And there, and if that's the case, then I might revise. I might be easier on early stopping. Like it might actually be something you want to do. Yes. 
question regarding the class environment. If you have a highly class environment data, is that resulting in overfitting scenario or underfitting scenario? Um, class imbalance can um, can cause well, so. Class imbalance, like generally, the problem there is that you'll perform really badly on the classes that you have less data for. And so that might actually not even show up in your error. All right, so coming back to our example, um, you know, uh, now we're in the, the scenario where we have good trading error, our validation error is not good. Um, and so we might you know, increase our data set size from 10,000 to 250,000. And that might eliminate most of our validation error. But we're not done. Um, it's still not quite there. So we might add weight decay and data augmentation. Um, and then we might you know, tune um, some of the hyperparameters. So that, uh, yeah, so in the course of this, we've like, made our training error worse. And so we might go back to hyperparameter optimization. And you know, maybe that'll put us in, in the regime that we want to be in. OK, so the next step is if there's some distribution shift, then we need to try to address that. Um, the first way to do that is, um, and I think like probably the most promising way is through um, through error analysis, and this actually applies to um, eliminating any of the sources of error. And I'll talk in more detail about this. Um, and once you've found the the types of errors that are common, you can either go out and collect more data, which is the best way to do it if you can, or you can just synthesize data, which can also be effective if you can't collect data. Um, and then last, there's a bunch of techniques around like domain adaptation, um, which can help you um, adjust the shift between the training and test distribution. Um, but in practice, I think these don't work all that well. Um, but they're, they are a good thing to have in the toolkit. OK, so let's talk about error analysis. Um, I think this is actually a super important step when you're trying to improve your model's performance. And the way this works is um, you know, just take your, take your training set or take your validation set. Um, and look at the places where you have um, where you have where you have errors. So, like you can look at all the errors that your all the mistakes your model is making, or if it's making a lot of mistakes, you can look at the ones with the highest residual, and then just kind of try to mentally group them, right? So, um, you know, one type of error that this model seems to be making is like there's actually a pedestrian maybe in in this bottom right corner, but it's it's genuinely very hard to see. And so like, we as humans probably couldn't solve that problem. Um, there's also another type of error, which is it seems to do poorly maybe on images where there are reflections. Um, so we might say, like, OK, reflections are another place where this model has trouble. Um, and uh, both of those two types of errors are present in uh, maybe like in the, both the test validation set and the train validation set. But then there's this. Um, this one particular type of error that we only see in the test validation set, maybe, and maybe it's night scenes. Um, and so, you know, one like one way that you can walk through what to do about different error types is, um, or like, so so an example of how you could walk through this is, um, so we have this one error type that was hard to see pedestrians, and maybe we estimate that this is like around 0.1 percent of our error um, in both train val and test val. Um, and you know the the the, sen the solution that we need there, like since we as humans can actually solve this problem, might just be better sensors. Um, and so we'll give this low priority because it's not a huge contributor to error, and the potential solution is really hard. <coughs> so the next source of error was reflections, and you know maybe this is um, a little bit higher contributor to error. Um, and you know some ways that you could get around this are you could you know, go and actually collect more data where there's reflections. Or you could try to synthesize reflections. So you could take images without reflections and artificially add them. Um, or you could try to, you know, the flip side of that is you could take the images that do have reflections and use some pre-processing to try to remove them. Or again, you could maybe get better sensors and solve things that way. Um, so this is a bigger problem than hard to see pedestrians, but um, it's still only medium priority because it's still a relatively low contributor to the, to the error. Um, but then, you know, maybe we look at nighttime scenes, and we see that this is actually um, a very small contributor to train val error, but it's a relatively large contributor to test val error. Um, and so this tells us that there's some distribution shift between our training set and our test set. And so, you know, there's the the interventions here might be to go out and collect more data in nighttime scenes, or we might try to synthetically 
darken some of our daytime scenes so they look more like nighttime scenes. Um, or we might try to simulate entirely new um, nighttime scenes from, from scratch. Um, or we could try some sort of domain adaptation technique to try to address this. Um, and maybe, you know, since this is the biggest contributor to, um, to test file error, and because some of these interventions are not really that difficult, like synthetically darken, darkening training images, we might say, you know, based on the types of errors that we've seen, this one is the highest priority. Yeah, question. So in the case where you add synthetic data, augmentations from data, like in this case, the reflection, you might know what you need to do. But if you see a specific case, how do you identify what transformation you need to create that synthetic data? Yeah, so the question is, if you identify like some source of error in your data, then how do you identify what type of synthetic data to use in order to address that? Um, the answer is it's, it just really depends, um, and it's it's like very problem specific. You know, there are a lot of things in vision where you know you can um, where you can use like knowledge about computer graphics to figure out solutions, um, but you know I don't think there's a general approach to that. Yeah. So in this example, by darkening the image, we are losing some information, and that is fine in the scenario that we have self driving cars. In some scenarios, you have more black, like we can say night. Because when you go to the daytime, we have more objects and more features. Yeah, so, so the question is, um, any recommendations for lightening scenes instead of darkening? Um, uh, no specific recommendations there. OK. Um, so I want to just say a few words about domain adaptation. Um, so what is domain adaptation? So these are like a set of techniques where you train on some source distribution and you, you know, generalize to another target distribution using um, only a limited amount of labeled data from the target distribution. Uh, maybe, you ha maybe you actually have access to lots of unlabeled data, but very limited labeled data. And you know, this might make sense to use if, you, if it's easy for you to get um, access to uh, data from your, your source distribution, but it's hard to get data from your test distribution. Um, and um, yeah, and so there, there are a few types of demand adaptation that are worth knowing about. Um, one is supervised domain adaptation. And this is where you, know, you do actually have some labeled data from your target domain. You just don't have very much of it. Um, and so some examples of this are just you know, fine tuning a pre-trained model, um, which, you know, works which often works extremely well. It's a very good idea if you have limited data in your, in your target domain. Um, or you know, another, uh, a similar approach is instead of training your model first on the source domain and then fine tuning on the target domain, you can train jointly on data from both data sets. Um, and in practice, sometimes uh, one works better than the other, and it's a little bit hard to know in advance which one. So if, if one or the other isn't working well, then you can try doing both. Another type of domain adaptation is unsupervised. Um, and so this is where you have, like, you actually have uh, maybe even a lot of data from your target domain, but the problem is you don't have labels for that data. Um, and so there, there are some techniques here, like um, correlation alignment or cycle GAN, um, that people use to try to bridge the gap when you have um, a reasonable amount of unlabeled data from your target domain. And um, these, I think, are more in the in the uh, the realm of sort of research ideas at this point. And so if you're um, uh, if you want to try them, there's a possibility that they'll work on your problem, um, but in general, they don't work all that well. Yes. So should you use another neural network to augment your data? Um, what, what do you mean? Do you, do you mean like, um, like doing a cycle GAN or something like that? Yeah, for example, to like bring your test data to your, like, or like make your train data similar to your test data, use mm -hmm. another cycle GAN, yep. shift everything to that domain, and then train on it. Yeah, so the question is like, there are all these sort of image um, style transfer techniques where you can, um, you can make images from one domain look like they come from the other domain. Um, I think. This is, this is like very unproven. Um, I think it's a good thing to try. I've seen this be effective in some of the work that I've done. Um, but um, I think it's pretty challenging to get it to work. One common pitfall here is um, just because image, images look similar to us um, doesn't mean that they're actually uh, statistically similar enough for the model to generalize. Um, and so I think this can work well when it supplements um, you know, 
uh, ordinary training on, um, on images that are actually from the target domain. Um, yeah, well, I'll take one more question on this. Yeah, are there, are there rules of thumb for making sure that the domain ad, um, adapted image is realistic enough to train on? Um, no. I mean, it, it's like the challenge is that um, the, I've seen, you know, for example, people produce synthetic images with CycleGAN that look indistinguishable from real images. But if you entirely train on those images, um, your model does not think that they look identical to real images and will still completely overfit to the synthetic distribution. Um, so this is still a very hard problem. Okay, and so you know the, the last thing um, is we've addressed underfitting, overfitting, and distribution shifts, and then there's one more possible problem, which is through all the course of tuning to our validation set, we might have overfit to it. Um, and so if you know if your test error um, at this, if you get to this point and you evaluate your test error and it's much worse, then that means you've overfit to your validation set. And um, when it does, the you know the simple solution here is resample your validation set. And and um, and kind of uh, go back. All right. The, the last thing that I want to say something about is um, hyperparameter tuning. Um, and you know, the hyperparameter tuning is really challenging because um, it's like very difficult to build intuition about why some hyperparameters have the effect on models that they do. And there are, and there are tons of hyperparameters um, that you might want to tune. Um, so, one thing that, um, uh, yeah, and, and, and like even worse than that, um, the right hyperparameters to tune um, can sometimes depend on which model you're actually using. So, it's like, it's not, having a general rule for which things you tune doesn't really work. Um, what I've tried to do, um, and I'll, I'll display this on the right in a second, is um, List, a list of common hyperparameters to tune, and then kind of my just very high-level assessment of, um, of how sensitive models tend to be to tuning these hyperparameters. Um, so, you know, to try to give you a sense of which ones you might try tuning first. Um, but, you know, the caveat here is that um, this is like only a rule of thumb, and every model is different. So, learning rate, I think, is, is um, the model is very sensitive to, and it's a very good thing to, to tune, um, as well as the learning rate schedule. So how quickly you decay the learning rate, whether to oscillate the learn learning rate as you decay. Um, optimizer choice, I think, um, generally doesn't make a huge difference. Um, other hyper optimizer hyperparameters um, sometimes makes a big difference, but in general is something I tune later. Um, batch size in some problems, like reinforcement learning, makes a huge difference, but usually is, is not something I would, I would tune if I'm just training on a single GPU. Um, Weight initialization can matter a lot for some problems, but, um, but the defaults are usually relatively sensible. Loss function makes a huge difference. So if you're using um, L2 and you switch to L1, that'll have a very big impact, uh, impact on the performance of your model. Um, the depth of your model, you know, again, sometimes adding more layers makes a big difference. Um, the size of the layers, so moving from layers that have width 128 to 512 can make a very big difference. Um, and tuning things like the kernel size and, uh, can, can also make a big difference. Okay, and so, so the last topic here is, um, is how to do hyperparameter optimization. And um, Sergey talked a little bit about this, so I'll go through it pretty quickly. Um, but, um, you know, the, actually I think the most common hyperparameter optimization technique in practice is just um, manually selecting hyperparameters. Um, and the other name for this is um, graduate student descent, um, <laughs> because this is what like entire army of um, PhD students have been have been employed doing for like the last ten years, um, at least. Um, and so I think the key advantage of this technique is that um, so it's really hard, but if you're good at it, then you know this is like the way to get the best um, results with the fewest computational cycles. Um, that's kind of why it makes sense to pay grad students to do it because grad students are super cheap and you know, sometimes they're cheaper than compute. Um, um, the disadvantage is you, like, you really, really need to understand the problem and the algorithm in order to make this work. And it's like really um, intensely time consuming. Um, another method is grid search. 
um, which just means that you know, if you have two hyperparameters, you might, um, you might split the possible values into a grid and then just sample all the points on that grid. Um, really easy to implement and sometimes works pretty well. Um, but it's not a very efficient way of doing hyperparameter search because you know, if, you have, if you imagine having more than two hyperparameters, then the, like, all the cross combinations will be, become like, very, very large very quickly. Um, and then also, like, you kind of have to select where you want the grids to be. Is it like between 0.1 and 1, or is it between you know, um, 0 0.0001 and like 1,000? So you need a little bit of maybe prior knowledge to select those um, effectively. Um, one thing that tends to work better than grid search is random search. So um, again, like if you have some ranges for your hyperparameters, instead of choosing grid points along them, you just random, uniformly um, sample points at random from within this grid. Um, there's some academic re results that suggest that this usually works better than, than grid search. Um, but uh, in practice, I actually inter interestingly see people do grid search more. And I think the reason is that like it, it's like a psychological thing. It just kind of feels nice to have a learning rate of like 0 0.1 instead of you know, 0 0.10379. Um, I don't know. It's not a very strong disadvantage, but I, I kind of feel like that's one reason people don't use it as much as they should. Um, and then similar disadvantage, if your ranges are wrong, you're not going to get good results. Um, a, a variant of this that like, works extremely well often is doing this in a course-defined way. So starting with a course grid, um, doing some hyperparameter search, zooming in on the best performers, and then resampling the grid from within that range. Um, and so this, this can work. Um, this, this is like is a very effective way of choosing hyperparameters often. Um, but it's, it's a little bit manual, because you kind of have to use some judgment to decide where you want your, um, your grid to, to be subsampled from, and kind of when to stop subsampling. And then the last is um, Bayesian hyperparameter optimization. And Sergey said some words about this yesterday. Um, the, um, this is like the most effective way of selecting hyperparameters in a hands-off way. Um, the challenge is that like, it's uh, notoriously tricky to implement on your own. And the algorithms are actually simple, but I think it's the details that make it super tricky. Um, but the, there are some off-the-shelf tools to do this, um, which can sometimes be uh, a little bit tricky to, to integrate with your code base. Um, but that said, you know, when your code base gets mature, I think eventually it makes sense to move to a, to a scheme like this. OK, and so in, in summary, I think like, my recommendation here is use course-defined random searches. Um, and then as your, uh, as your code base and as your project gets more mature, then maybe consider moving to Bayesian hyperparameter optimization. All right, so in conclusion, um, deep learning debugging is hard. And the reason that it's hard is because there's all these different sources of error that um, could be the cause of some degradation in performance that you see. And so because of that, the best way to get bug-free deep learning models is to um, very gradually ramp up the complexity of the, the model and the data set that you're using. Um, and there's you know, a series of steps that I recommend that you walk through to make this as easy as possible. Um, and, um, and yeah, and I, I think there's also a few really good resources that, um, that you should check out if you want to learn more about this topic. All right, thank you. OK, we're, we're running a little bit late, so maybe I'll, um, if there are any questions, uh, I'm happy to take a couple, um, and then we'll, we'll break for our morning break. Yeah. Yeah, um, so the question is, um, how does neural architecture search fit into this? Um, I think of neural architecture search as a um, subset of hyperparameter search. Like, your, your architecture is really a hyperparameter um, that you can choose. And I think um, neural architecture search is extremely promising. And I think, you know, in 10 years, people will think it's crazy that, you know, an entire generation of, um, of grad students, like, grew up designing architectures by hand from scratch. Um, but I think right now, the reality is, um, unless you have a really high computational budget, it doesn't work all that well. Yep. Um, uh, can you kind of go into, like, what would be a good kind of a time for a single, kind of like an engineer to go through this process so when you um, communicate to the business that, so, okay, like, here, like, it kind of works like it's like an end-to-end, -end, but it doesn't work that well. And then they kind of, you know, kind of get good points. Like, they don't have any idea of 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, the question is like, can I give an estimate of how long each of these phases would take? Um, no. <laughs> it's, um, it's, there's no real rule of, rule of thumb because, um, again, I think like assessing problem difficulty in machine learning is extremely hard. Um, and so I think like the way, to, the way to really do this is to um, take a hard look at like some of the drivers of how difficult, of how difficult machine learning projects are. And you know, again, like it's, it's things like, um, you know, how good is work on similar problems to the one that you're gonna work on? Like, are there people who have published papers that, you know, completely blow away your expectation of performance or is it like, um, or is there, not the, is there no literature about it? Um, two, like, how available is data? You know, meaning both how easy is it to collect data but also how easy is it to label data? Um, and then, um, yeah, and then three, like, how much, you know, how much computational budget do you have available for this? Um, and then I think, the other thing I would say there is like, um, I think it's really important to get something working end to end quickly, even if that thing is really bad. So, um, you know, for example, like one way that I might try to do this estimation is I might say like, well, let's say we have a two, team of two or three people and we're working on this problem. We don't think this should be a particularly challenging machine learning problem, but most machine learning problems end up being challenging at some point. So what we'd like to do is get just like the very, very simplest possible version of this system on a simplified version of our data set working in a week. Um, and then evaluate the performance and kind of and make estimation and make estimates from there. Yeah. And what computational budget would you consider evolution to have um, what computational budget would I consider as being reasonable using for evolutionary using evolutionary search? Um, yeah, I can't comment on that technique. Yeah. Can you explain the learning rate schedule? You mentioned that it's medium sensitivity to have. Um, yeah, so I think learning rate schedule, so like learning rates um, obviously have huge impact on model performance. Um, just picking a fixed learning rate is like, is a very, very quick lever for changing your model performance, but then in practice to get really good performance, usually you need to decay the learning rate um, as you go along. And picking the way that you decay that learning rate is uh, extremely difficult, and um, and you know finding the right schedule can be hard. Um, but I think like generally, there like you know again like my, my philosophy here is that usually when you're doing this type of hyperparameter tuning, you're not like the goal you should have in mind is not to achieve optimal performance, but it's just to achieve better performance than you had before. Um, so like hopefully that makes it a little bit easier. Um, isn't learning rate decay usually taken care of by the optimizer? No. Maybe you that an adaptive optimizer. Yeah, so there, there is, um, like, Atom is an adaptive um, learning rate method, but it's still useful to, um, to decay the base learning rate of Atom um, as, as you learn. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, we're going to take a break next, and we'll come back at... Um, 40 after.